everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 223. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Radis Cardis, and this is sort of like the card game version of Radis. And it really is not anything like Radis, and I actually uh, didn't care for Radis at all. Uh, but uh, this is definitely an interesting game. It plays two to five players in about a half an hour. It plays pretty quickly. Uh, so let me just show you how it works, and I'll tell you what I think of it. Okay, I've got the play area set up here. You can take notice of a couple of different things here. First, we've got this little scoring track type of thing here. You can see there's six different sort of types of cards that are going to be in the game. And these symbols here uh, match those different types of cards. And you've got a little scoring track there. So the majority of ways that you're going to score points in this game is by moving uh, tokens in your player color up each of these tracks. So whoever, at the end of the game, whoever has the highest in a particular track is going to get 10 points. Second highest will get 5, and then third highest will get uh, 2, if there is a third highest. So there's 6 discs in each player color, and then each player is going to get 2 in front of them, one just to kind of remember which color you are, and then another one that you're going to be using to sort of uh, do sort of a worker placement type of thing on some of these other cards. The other thing players are going to start with is they're going to get 10 points worth of these rats here. So you got different denominations, fives, threes, and ones. Everybody's going to have 10 points worth, and then you're going to keep these face down because you will be acquiring some of these and also getting rid of some of these. You've also got some basic victory point markers here that you might get during the game. you got some special cards on this side, and then you have sort of your two main types of cards here. So the first thing you're going to do is going to deal five of these uh, person cards out in front of the table for everybody to see, but these are going to be face down. Now, at the end of the game, you're going to reveal these, and you're going to count the pawns here that may or may not be on the cards. And if you have more rat tokens, or more value, you know, worth of rats, then you're not going to be able to win the game. So, let's say we had ended the game, and then we reveal this. We got one, four, six, and ten. So, if you had ten, which is what we started with, uh, or if you had, excuse me, if you had more than ten, then you wouldn't be able to win the game. But if you had ten or less, then you'd be in good shape. Now you will be able to get different abilities uh, from different actions and possibly peek at some of these cards so you may have some idea uh, what's going to be here. But I've seen it, you know, different swings. I've seen it where it's like 4 only or even up to 12. So you really kind of have to sort of push your luck in terms of you know acquiring too many of these rat tokens there. So players are going to start off with a hand of 5 cards and again these icons here you can see match all of the different tracks up there. So you're going to start with 5 of these. And then, depending on the number of players, you're going to uh, make up this deck in a different way. But basically, you're going to have at least five of each of the six different types. So, you can see here we've got here the coin, and this different shield, and another coin. So, you're going to kind of shuffle this up, and then you're going to remake the deck so that you have five of each of the six different types up there. And then, depending on the number of players, you'll take some out to kind of use as sort of a backup. And so, the, what's going to happen is you're going to play a certain number of rounds based on the number of players. Every round, uh, the uh, first player marker is going to move around, and then you're going to reveal a certain number of these cards, and these will be face up for everybody to look at. So what does a round consist of? Well, let's say we're playing a two or a three player game here, and in that case we're only going to reveal two different cards here. Now, every, you can see in the upper left hand corner there's an action that everybody can take. So starting with the start player, each player can choose one of the two actions. It doesn't matter if anybody's chosen it before you or not. So this one you can see it says draw two cards, and this is the people cards here, and remove one of your rat tokens, discard it out of the game. Or you can choose to draw four cards, it's your choice. Now there can be a whole different you know, slew of things here, you can draw four cards, uh, draw four, draw two, remove a rat, uh, not doing it very good here. So you can remove two rats, draw three cards, you can remove a rat and then maybe look at one of the face down cards, so that's what that little eyeball is. So everybody's going to take and choose one of those actions and then do it. And then starting with the start player, we're going to go and we're going to take one of our uh, markers here and then put it in the topmost spot. So if I was the yellow player, maybe I would go here and I would try to basically sort of win and activate these abilities at the bottom. Or I may have chosen to go over here on this card and then chosen to activate that ability there. And then maybe red comes in after me and chooses that. Now when you choose your spot, you're going to have to put a certain number of your people cards face down. And what you're trying to do is match the icon on this side. So here we've got a wheat field, and so you want to have 
you know, a bunch of wheat fields that you put face down. However, you don't have to put just wheat fields down. If I wanted, I could put all four of these down. And then what's going to happen after everybody's put a token there and then put a certain number of cards face down, everybody's going to reveal. Now, the number of people cards is the number of spaces you're going to move up that track. However, for every card that is not matching, so even though I put four cards here, I'm going to move up four spots, but three of these don't match the wheat, so I'm going to take three rat tokens as sort of a penalty. So you can still try to push your way up the track, because remember, that's the most ways that you're going to score points. But you can also sort of, you know, do it in sort of a corrupt manner, I guess you could say, and actually acquire rat tokens, keeping in mind that you, you don't want to get too many rat tokens. So whoever puts the most people cards and moves up the most on that track is going to activate the top most ability. So even if you take corruption, you're still going to get credit in a sense for moving up the track and be able to activate the top most. Now everybody else is going to be able to activate the bottom most. And like in this case, and there are all a bunch of different ones here. So this one says for each spot that you moved up, you can draw a card. So if I, in this case, if I played four, I draw four cards. Everybody else is going to activate only half of that. It's so X divided by two. So let's say four wasn't enough to be first place here, then uh, then I would only get to draw two cards because it would be half the number of cards I played. And if there's a tie, then it's whoever came in first because uh, going last is a little bit better because you're going to have more opportunities to look at the different cards that come up and see where people are going, which ones you're going to have an easier time getting first place in and things like that. So some of the special abilities on these buildings are going to allow you to acquire these different item cards here. So first let's take a look at these jokers. Now these jokers basically are the same as people cards. And you can see all of these cards here have the same back. So you can submit all these cards into any uh, location that you want. Now the jokers work just like the people except you're not going to get a penalty. They basically act as the icon that you want it to act as. And then when you play the jokers you'll reveal them and then they'll go back in the stack here. And so those are pretty handy. Uh, now the swords are very interesting because when you play swords, so let's say I would have played, let's say, six cards, right? Then I would move up only four spaces because I'd only move up four people cards. But then these swords would not contribute to my moving up on the track, but they would basically be attacking any of the players who were in the same building as me. So if orange and yellow were in here, then let's say yellow played the swords, then basically yellow could attack the orange player. And the way that the swords work, and the way that they attack the player, is once you've resolved the card, then that player has to give you half of their cards rounded down. Now the way that works is, let's say I played two swords, and then you'd play two swords. Then we would basically sort of cancel each other out, and we'd target the person that played the least amount of swords. Or let's say I had played two swords, and then Billy had played one sword, and then the blue player had played none. So Billy's basically safe. He doesn't get to attack anybody because his one sword was there sort of preventing. But since I played the most swords, I'm going to target the person that played the least swords. In this case, the blue player who played zero. So the swords are very interesting, and you're going to know because the cards are going to come up, and they're going to show you, okay, you know, Joel took a couple of swords, so <laughs> by golly, I'm going to try to stay away from his buildings because he's really going to screw me over or whoever goes into the buildings with him. So that adds a very interesting dynamic to, you know, the card play. Uh, now, the flutes are uh, work in a similar manner. Whoever plays the most flutes can give one of their rats to uh, a player who played the least number of flutes, and it works in the same sort of logic as the swords. Now, the uh, time markers here, when you play this, you basically will play that, and then you can skip your uh, choice. So, if, you know, Billy goes, and then Joel goes, and then it's your turn, um, then, uh, and then you can play the uh, time marker, and then everybody else who hasn't played can go after you, and then you can kind of come in at the end. So, that's also an interesting uh, way to, you know, try to figure out where people are going, how many cards they're going to put down, and stuff like that. Finally, you have these uh, gold coin cards, and some of these buildings will award uh, either one or two of these cards. And basically, at the end of the game, whoever has the most of these cards gets six points, and then whoever has the second most will get three points. And that's it. You're going to play a fixed number of rounds, and then at the end of the game, you're going to total up all these. So again, if you're highest on these, you're going to get ten points uh, per one that you're highest on, and then five, and then two. You're going to add up any victory points that you get. Some of these buildings will award victory points to the person that has the most. 
you're going to get two points for whoever has the most uh, people cards. So whoever has just the most people left over gets two points. Whoever has the most of the each of these different items here will get two points. And then again, you're going to get your six or three for the gold coins. But again, you got to do all that while keeping in mind that you won't want to get too many rat tokens or else you're just going to not even be involved at all. Okay, hope you enjoyed the overview. I apologize for the cold, by the way. I'm just trying to get over a cold here, so I sound kind of muffled. But uh, this is a very enjoyable game. I was actually quite surprised how much I enjoy this game. We've been playing it a lot for the last couple of weeks at work. And there's a lot of cool dynamics that will take place uh, you know, when you play the game. Like I was talking about with the swords. Somebody gets a sword, you're trying to kind of stay away from them. Or, you know, maybe you still go in there and you spend a lot of cards uh, to dump your hand and then they don't have that much that they can take from you. And then you've got the whole dynamic of, you know, do I really kind of push a little bit extra to jump ahead on a track even though I'm going to take a lot of corruption because I'm not going to play the cards that match, you know, the building. And, you know, you've got to keep in mind, you know, ha does Billy look at the, uh, the people cards that have the little pawns on them? You know, how, how much does he know? What actions has he been taking? Because a lot of those, uh, you know, that initial action that you take each round that everybody can choose from, you know, there's a definite difference between drawing four cards and losing two rats. And, you know, early in the game, well, I, I'm doing okay on rats, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I've seen people play it kind of different ways. You kind of dump all your rats early. And then you, know, you don't have to worry about it. And then you try to draw cards up and you see how many more rats you can take from there. It's interesting because if, you know, like I said, if Billy's seen in a lot of the cards and taken a lot of those look actions. And then he starts to play conservatively, starts dumping his rats. Then you're like, okay, well, did he see a bunch of cards with no pawns on them? So he's kind of convinced there's only going to be like four rats allowed at the end of the game. Or is he trying to trick you and bluff you that way? Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff like that that's going to happen and, you know, trying to read the other players and figuring out, you know, where the building to go in is best and, you know, trying to get all the good points that way, trying to sort of get on the board, if you will, across all the different, uh, you know, the six different types. Uh, and that's going to change when you have more players. It's basically going to uh, be a little bit different because, you know, only winning one or two is maybe better with five, but if you're playing with like three players or two even, uh, then, uh, you know, you want to get on the board across all of them. And I, I, I have played this with two, and it's fine with two. It actually works really well with two, and that's something that was kind of interesting. It's definitely cooler with more players because you get more buildings out, and you get those swords and the different uh, flutes and those kind of things will come out, so that adds that nice extra layer. Whereas with two players, you know, okay, it's just, you, okay, you got swords and I got swords, and I can basically play in whatever building you don't. And then you kind of, you know, worm your way around that way. But that dynamic still is there with two players. Uh, so anyway, yeah, definitely take a look at this game. It is very, very interesting, very fun, and it plays really quickly. And the end of the game is really cool because it's kind of like that big reveal of how many rat tokens were going to be allowed. And then, you know, somebody that was going to win, but they had, you know, one too many rat tokens, and then they're screwed. They're out of luck. And then, you know, the next goes to the next player. So that's a very exciting moment. And those last couple of rounds be get really interesting. You know, as people are like, oh, I don't want to take any more rat tokens. And, you know, that's just, it's just really fun that way. So, and again, definitely take a look at this. Thanks.